The following is an audio transcript written by a psychotherapist and has been edited for education and training purposes. Information about the health plan and psychotherapist has been removed. As you listen, think about what is happening and what you would do differently. I have a story to tell you that is a professional nightmare. I am a psychotherapist provider for a well-known health plan. The company's behavioral health services are managed by a behavior health company. One day I received a phone call from a company whose name I can't remember. The wanted to confirm my name and address so they can send me a request for records for several patients as part of what they call an initial proof of service. The person I am talking to doesn't know exactly what proof of service means. I jokingly say, does that mean a picture of myself and my patients in my office? She laughs and says no and tells me it's just part of a routine record review. I asked if she can fax the request to my secure fax line or email me an encrypted copy. To my surprise, I received an email and a fax. I don't open the email version because I don't recognize the sender and the zip file looks suspiciously like a Trojan virus. I review and correct my chart notes. I then scan them into a PDF and upload them into the portal for which I am provided a link and a key code. About three months later, I received a call from a health plan that wanted to talk with me in order to discuss a patient's record. We schedule a date for an interview. I was in a panic. I posted an embarrassing message on a listserv. I was asking for guidance and I did not know what to do. Several people told me about their audit nightmare privately. They gave me their advice based on what they learned from the experience. Eventually I had to face the auditor. My auditor told me her name first and then informed me that she had a master's in social work. When I asked what state she was licensed she informed me that she was not allowed to provide that information. Of course this is all on a recorded line. What happened next and looking back can only be described as the proverbial frog in a pot of water on a gas stove. At first the conversation was comfortable. Then she turned up the heat. The temperature of water increased slowly. Questions became increasingly clinical, disjointed, and confusing. The temperature was rising, and just like a frog, I did not feel the trouble I was in. The interview starts out innocently enough with an auditor who wants me to confirm the date of service. She asked, when did I last see the patient? What was the diagnosis? Was there a secondary diagnosis? She asked me how treatment was going with this patient. I found myself talking to her like I would with any other professional. Looking back, she was getting me into the habit of answering questions quickly. The initial questions were so easy to answer. But the questions didn't stay easy. I wanted to talk with them. They wanted answers. We talked about a lot of things. I was asked, what were your treatment goals for this patient? What interventions did I use? Did the goals change? How did I measure progress towards achieving the goals? How did I measure progress? She asked were my objectives specific and measurable. The auditor wanted to know why I used so many 9083 sevens. She asked why I saw this patient more than once a week for two months. She asked me about why I diagnosed the patient with severe major depression. I told her the patient was severely abused as a child and was being abused in her marriage. She wanted to know in what way my patient was neglected and abused. She wanted to know what made her depression severe. It finally dawned on me that she might be interrogating me. I was trying to be genuine and see if I could refocus the conversation to a professional-to-professional -professional dialogue. She told me that she had only a couple more questions and that I'm doing fine. She asked me whether or not the patient had any significant crisis while working with me and if I ever felt that they needed or might need to be referred to an emergency department. Her final question was interesting. She asked how much longer I will see this patient. She pointed out that I had seen this patient four to two times. I told her that I might need to see this patient for a while longer because she was making progress but still had a ways to go. She stated that she understood. She politely told me that she had all the information she needed at this point, and after having reviewed the record, she felt it would be necessary to refer this case to their clinical standards team and that I would be hearing from them because my records may not meet their clinical standards and requirements. I asked her how long that would take. She said they are very busy and that it would be several months. I asked her why they requested three patient records, but we only discussed one. 
She said the clinical team would review all three records. She said if they have any questions, someone from their team will contact me. I was numb. I could not think of anything to say. I thought what just happened. Like any vid therapist, my response was to maintain a positive relationship. I spent weeks thinking about this. I could not figure out why she specific questions like, what are my specific measurable objectives? Who talks like that? I thought about this call for weeks. I found the health plan provider information website. I read their clinical standards and their information about coding. I talked with colleagues. I kept asking myself what happened. How could I have been so naive and unprepared? The pair finally sent me a letter. The letter they stated that based on review of my chart notes, I did not adequately document the medical necessity of the services I provided, that I deviated from clinical standards, and that they are requesting a recuperation of 29,000 for deficiencies in all three records. Furthermore, they were reserving the right to review my records again and to terminate my contract if I did not pay back all the money. And in order to appeal their judgment, I would need to pay the $29,000 first. In my opinion, my being asked to talk with an auditor was a trap. H had no idea that I was lured into being open and was actually being probed. I was given every opportunity to save or incriminate myself. I realize now that she was auditing my response to what should have been more transparent purposes. My mistake was that I did not know what the auditor expected. I did not know what to tell her. I should not have answered her questions and I should refer to my chart notes. All I could do was talk about my patient like I do with other psychotherapists. I gave her way more private information than she needed. I didn't know what else to say. I answered the auditor's questions when I should have told them what they needed to know. But I did not know what they needed to know. I did not know the magic words. All I did was dig a hole for myself I could not get out of. How do I summarize what happened? First, I'm going to pay back half the money. It would cost me more to appeal this than I would recover. I had to hire an attorney to talk to the auditor's attorney and write a compromise proposal that would protect me. I have never been audited. I have a lot of experience with peer consultation. This is not consultation. This is an audit. That lack of transparency can set people like me up to fail because we follow widely accepted clinical practice guidelines and standards, but we do not understand auditing and how to talk to an auditor. I also need to give an auditor's treatment records that will protect my patient's privacy and my practice. Some therapists find out that I was audited and they ask me what happened. Some want to know what they should they do if they are audited. I'm still trying to figure out what to do. What I can tell you, based on what I did, is what you shouldn't do. If an auditor asked you why you use so many 90837s, don't say the patient was in a crisis. If they ask you why you have seen the patient four to two times, don't tell them they're really depressed and that you're going to need to see them for a while longer because their progress is slow. If an auditor asks you about how you measure progress, don't say something like I no longer have to see the client twice a week. I have learned that this is an artifact, not a measurable fact. If they ask you how the client is doing, ask the auditor if they can be more specific. Don't just start talking about examples of how the client changed their life, especially if you do not have a valid narrative in your chart note. Auditors are asking if you have measurable evidence, not just a story. Stories with happy endings don't matter to them. Finally, an auditor has a checklist. They are recording your session and probably checking boxes. If the auditor knows more about auditing than you do, you need to find someone who knows at least as much as an auditor. If they don't want to talk to you, then you may just get a letter about their decision. If they do talk with you, it could mean they want to give you a chance to dig a hole for yourself. Or they may be trying to confirm that you have no additional information to defend what could be an open and shut case. I finally called a health plan to ask questions about documentation. That was not an audit. That person was helpful but not very helpful. I believe there are good auditors. They are not all hired guns. But I think only hired guns work for health plans. I think you will be as foolish as I was if you don't know what auditors are looking for. You are even more foolish if you think you can use your powers of relationship building to convince an auditor to trust you.
so much that they will believe you are a good therapist and you're helping their members. Their job is to be objective, or at least to appear objective. And that means they will not help you prove that you are a good therapist. I think my auditor was trying to be professional. She established rapport, asked legitimate questions, and did not argue with me. But she certainly was not taking my side because she liked me. She was investigating me for improper behavior based on their criteria. Oh, one last thing. If your auditor tells you they are some kind of clinician, don't believe them if they won't tell you where they are licensed. Health plans don't use licensed clinicians for auditors. Licensed clinicians can be held to a higher standard than ordinary employees. The word clinician is not a legal thing. It has taken me a very long time to deal with the emotional consequences of this audit. I am still upset. I lost a lot of money because I did not know any better. I don't know why we are not trained or prepared for audits. Even though this was more than two years ago, I reflect a lot on all this.